Joining us for more is Carl Rotter from Capital.com. So, Carl, over the weekend, got a pulse check on China's economy. Yeah, and it kind of told us a little bit of what we already knew, which is that the manufacturing sector is sort of chugging along. But uh, we saw a downside surprise in the non-manufacturing data, which, of course, just reflects the weakness in households at the moment. And, I mean, that's really... Uh, the locus um, of this problem in China at the moment that, you know, effectively because of the impacts of the, the housing crisis and, you know, subsequently, uh, you know, incredible uh, weakness in household sentiment and household balance sheets that, you know, we're continuing to see retail activity fairly slow, services activity fairly slow, um, and this anemic sort of growth profile. So, I mean, these issues are, are long term, they're structural and they're fairly well known. Uh, but the fear is, of course, that with an incoming Trump administration that's going to slap these likely, as we keep hearing, uh, tariffs to some extent on, on China's uh, economy, that there's still um, a very, very weak mix in the absence, especially of, of more stimulus out of China. So, again, nothing that sort of should um, surprise anyone. And the data wasn't terrible, um, but it certainly just reaffirms the weakness uh, in China's economy and certainly uh, where that weakness is coming from, which is, of course, um, Chinese households. Yeah, and as you say, coming just as we're expecting to potentially see uh, another trade war, at least some trade tension between the incoming president. Uh, let's talk about our market. Looking like we might start December on a positive note, not a very strong lead from Wall Street with uh, the shortened holiday session, but we did see records hit. Yeah, certainly. And um, I mean, it's undeniable that we're in a bit of an uptrend. And, you know, there's a lot of knocks on this market at the moment, really, on the basis that if we you know, talk about its typical drivers, um, China's looking weak, you know, commodity demand is, is is fairly modest and commodity prices are fairly sluggish, despite the fact that there's a level of uh, tailwind there coming from the fact that the US economy is expected to sort of, you know, almost reflate potentially in, in some respects um, uh, because of all the stimulus from the Trump administration expected to come through. Um, but, you know, valuations are expensive. You know, we are seeing that sort of of weak domestic economic backdrop, which is raising questions about earnings, but valuations remain, you know, fairly high, multiples remain supported, and we're seeing this kind of continued uptrend manifesting, which, you know, for the large part is just because we're seeing continued strength on Wall Street as well. So not much of a, of a lead, obviously, from the United States, which was off um, for a couple of days in effect because of Thanksgiving. Um, but we're at the back end of the year now. You know, I'm starting to hear people already talk about, you know, whether we'll see a Santa rally. I think a lot of the... Um, that will be driven potentially by effectively what the Fed does in a couple of weeks' times, which, you know, we've got some relevant data points coming up in the next 24 hours, and of course this week that could determine that. Uh, but again, overall, the, the knock on the market at the moment is that it, it's expensive and the fundamentals might be a little bit weak. But nevertheless, um, there still seems to be the impetus to continue to drive uh, prices higher, probably more of an overseas story. Uh, but nevertheless, yes, a very constructive um, outlook if you, if you consider the fact that whenever we hit record highs, that's clearly a, bit, a bullish signal for the market. Indeed. And as you say, a big week as well. We've got third quarter GDP this week. We're going to hear from one of the RBA board members as well. Building approvals data today. Uh, what should we be looking out for? I guess all of that and more. Yeah, I mean, at least on the domestic front, uh, that GDP data is probably the highlight. Um, I think we have some retail sales data th uh, thrown in there as well, which is always helpful to get a pulse check on what is, you know, a fairly weak um, Australian consumer. But what are we likely to see in this data and will it affect RBA uh, policy considerations? Well, it's probably going to be a very similar narrative to, to what we've you know, had over the last year and a half, which is to say that, you know, on a per capita basis, pro growth is probably going to go backwards, that uh, demand is being supported by uh, net overseas migration uh, and a little bit of uh, public demand, which is, you know, more or less an extension of um, the continued support that like schemes like the NDIS uh, uh, provide for the economy. And the way that is going to kind of potentially impact RBA considerations is whether the weakness in the demand side of the economy is showing any indication of coming back into balance with the supply side of the economy. Because one thing that the RBA has told us, and, and perhaps you know speakers this week will, will kind of reaffirm, is that their focus isn't necessarily on the demand side of the economy because they're not... Uh, worried too much about demand being, um, you know, sort of too strong that this a lot of this inflation is being driven by demand factors that they acknowledge that um, demand is weak. But it's those supply side issues where we're still seeing an imbalance between supply and demand that, that's keeping inflation a little bit elevated. So um, I don't suspect that it'll change the outlook too much for RBA um, expectations, especially considering that the first cut as far as market pricing isn't baked in until the middle of the next year. And that has been deferred because of effectively the way that the, the markets are following US interest rate uh, expectations because of all of this um, support expected to come through to the US economy from the Trump administration. Uh, but we'll get that kind of pulse check. It's probably going to tell us that uh, economic growth is weak. Uh, but again, 
uh, that's probably not going to shift the RBA too much just because this is about the imbalance between supply and demand and that you know really poor performance of the supply side of the economy. And we continue to see economists push back the likelihood of when the RBA cuts. Really interesting to see AMP Shane Oliver, who's been steadfast in the fact that he thought the cutting cycle would begin sooner rather than later, pushing back as well. We've also had AMP Bank of Queensland. So the overall thesis, Kyle, that the RBA is really still trying to um, tame this inflation dragon. Yeah, I think so. And I mean, with those sorts of calls as well, there's often that split, at least for economists and Quite clearly, I'm not one of them, but um, that there's the argument of what people think the RBA ought to do right now compared to you know what the, they think the RBA will do. Uh, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Oliver and uh, you know some of those other high-profile economists uh, that have been you know calling for either you know imminent rate cuts or you know perhaps been pushing back fairly uh, fervently on the notion that any um, further hikes. Uh, are on the table, which up until probably over only the last couple of months were still being spoken about. Um, you know. Their, their opinion is largely that because household demand is so weak, uh, that it is the economy is being propped up uh, by you know factors like net, uh, overseas migration, uh, like you know that sort of elevated public demand. Um, it, when you really look and uh, look look down to things that you know a interest rate cuts to support households wouldn't be off the table, shouldn't be taken off the table, uh, should be fairly imminent, especially on the basis that inflation expectations are. Uh, pretty well anchored and aren't showing any signs that um, that we're getting any kind of negative feedback into uh, in, in terms of inflation that could see, you know, uh, inflation unanchored and, and, and picking up again. Uh, counter to that again is that, you know, the RBA has outlined a fairly different logic, a, a little similar to what I said before, which is about, you know, OK, demand is weak, but what our concern is, is really the supply side of the economy. And we're going to keep rates kind of higher for longer to bring that back into balance. Uh, and the other, other other argument from the RBA too would be that, you know, um, we have lifted interest rates to a level not as high as the rest of the world in an effort to maintain those labour market gains. The flip side of that is that while everyone else is cutting, uh, like the RBNZ last week, in response to recessionary um, uh, conditions in, 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 in their economies, uh, that we're just going to keep things high for longer um, uh, now and uh, you know sort of wait and see until inflation, hopefully, and in principle, because they think uh, interest rates for restrictive territories uh, will come back to target. So again, it, it's kind of a little bit um, nitpicky at the moment as to when the, next, the first cut will be, uh, just because the markets are pricing and that will be the next move. Uh, but we are still seeing that kind of deferral of when that uh, cut is likely to come. Uh, and again, a lot of those global factors because of um, expectations around changes in US fiscal policy is responsible for that as well.